Wow. So there's been times we've just and with my stuff too, when I bring a song, like a whole song, and I have to I have to take the same attitude of just like oh, here so it is. It's not as easy for you. <laughs> did I do this out? Yeah. I'm like, well, I have to. <laughs> you said I have to. So yes. Or that was a tell. To. <laughs> it's, hard, no, it's, it's hard for me, for, for sure. Sure. Because yeah. yeah. you've been a solo artist your whole life. Yeah. And he was a solo artist too. But, but, so we're just different in that way. I, to me, it's yeah. a little more like, you know, like, oh, especially yeah. when you finish like a chorus or a verse or, or mm-hmm. even a whole song that you yeah. love. And you get it like, you can't help but be attached to it. Yeah. Because if I'm not attached to it, in the beginning, I'm not going to show it to him. It's not about to finish it. Yeah. So if I feel like I have to, yeah. yeah. It's not accidental. Like, I, I think you have an, I know you and I know you're writing and you're an, you're an intentional person. So it's not like you're just kind of like, oh, I hear something that just flew out. Do whatever with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be I definitely hard. try to do the thing, you know, especially if it's just like parts. So the other thing about the collaborating with, with this band that I love is I can just, you know, start a song or whether it's like a groove or, or like a guitar part or a, a melody or a verse or just a part mm-hmm. and if I can't get any further with it with, that I'm happy with I can just stop and like send it over to that's great to the partner you know and trust that he's going to do something with it too and, and so we do that back and forth so in that way that's I think that's a super rare collaborative thing yeah. to just be able to trust somebody with, with an idea. I guess do melody and words kind of come simultaneously, or do you write a melody and then put words to it? Or I'm, as far as uh, lyrics and melody, I'm more of a um, phonetic guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. It has to sound a certain way, and then words will come out sometimes. Sure. Or I'll right. just try to shoehorn some words in, but so to me it's more important. It's gibberish. Yeah, yeah. Gibberish. Love gibberish. So really, in a way, the melody is what's taking the forefront, yeah, and you kind of design the words around that. Okay, so here's yeah. another question. I don't think I've ever written lyrics first. Really, ever? Maybe a couple um, times. I think every time I've ever tried to, I just it t- turns out cheesy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Turns out like a country song. It's like, a hard way to write. It's like Bob Dylan's way of writing, like a typewriter, and then he designs a song around that. That's not hard. That's you really can, hard to do. A lot of times you can hear it. I think. And he probably does internally know what he wants it to be like. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I've, I way personally, like I write like that same way the vast majority of the time yeah like I may know what I'm writing about even and just start having the feeling drive the melodies and phonetics and yeah. usually it'll be like a magic moment that I caught on when I was pressing record I'll be like whoa that's the verse or at least like when I'm no like melodically I'll just oh, be okay. like playing something and, and improvising phonetic gibberish because <laughs> you know like there's something about I think your soul knows what it wants to say, mm-hmm. and those syllables often end up st- sticking. I don't know when you write to it, you're like, yeah, it's just, it's got to be an E sound. There's like an A just, sound. Yeah. That doesn't feel right. 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 Yeah. Exactly. That's what I was gonna say. And it, it can turn into a title too. Yeah. You end up singing the title and like, oh, that's cool. You know, like it came to you in that. Dude, I heard an so interview with um, Stephen Tyler about James Got a Gun, and he was like, James Got a Gun. And that, like, he just came out, and he's like, "What does that mean?" And then you wrote that, <laughs> and that song was like very. Um, remember the video was about yeah. like a girl. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I remember that. Song, like yeah. a domestic kind of situation, like but that just came video. out. He just like said that. Like, was that on that documentary, The Making of Pump, or something? Or did you see probably? It I remember. It was that. on one of those Aerosmith yeah. things. You know, it's funny. Like um, a far less well-known song, but <clears throat> I had a song on my first record called "How Does It Feel." And that song started right away with, I just was sat down and went, Hey, beautiful lady. And I was like, beautiful lady. Oh, you started with the with The, the title and, and the melody came out together right when I was, yeah, yeah, so good. And I was just like, I don't want to say beautiful lady. <laughs> but you yeah. had to. But I had to. I, yeah. I tried so hard to replace it. And I'm like, that's Sometimes it's just right. Right. Totally, dude. I've, I've had the same be. problem. Like, I want it to sound cooler. And then you just keep trying to shoehorn something in, and you're like, forget it. No, it just has it. to be this. <laughs> yeah, it's so strange the way that works, and like, which that's why I think a lot of songwriters um, feel like they've been gifted songs, or there's some sort of conduit. I'm right. just there to accept. Yeah, I think that's. I want to believe that. I yeah. call it the subconscious. Maybe the, I don't know. Who knows? Same it's thing. Same thing. Yeah, it's something undefined that seems to just like bubble up. Because that's kind of what it feels like. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's because we can't pinpoint it and we can't, like, exactly figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but so here's a question for you. So once you've gone through your process with the drum machine, you've done the syllables, and you've written the chords, and you have pretty much the title and everything, mm-hmm. when you bring it into the band, what happens if the guy says, 
I don't really like the title, and I'm not really crazy about this one note yeah, melody. For sure. How do you how do you fit how do you like work that out in the band dynamic? Just, just go into the car and cry. <laughs> <laughs> just turn on like the you ever go, No, I keep this for my solo yeah. record. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Fun. I don't want to give it to you guys anyways. But has this happened though? Have you ever gone through that process, brought it in, somebody doesn't like it, you give in and say, okay, how can we fix it after you've cried? And you try to fix <laughs> it. Cry. And once you've done that, do you sometimes feel like, oh, you know what? It's actually better now than it was before. Or do you always yeah, feel like sure. you gave a piece of your soul? Yeah, you that, sold out just a little you just, bit. You just didn't do the full thing that you wanted to do. Yeah, compromise. What, what's you up? Feel like well, it's compromise okay, or? so I can think of a really specific example with the this was with the producer for the last okay. record that we did. Um, and this actually is probably going to be the single. Um, this was, and this is a cool example of the collaboration too. I, I was, we were in the writing process and I, was, I told Campbell like, hey, just send me um, like little snippets of you know, guitar riffs or like melody ideas that you have and I'll, I'll try to... And actually two songs on the record came out like that where he just sent me like... It was, it was, it was just an instrumental piece, you know? Okay. And I uh, ended up writing like lyrics and, and melodies to him. In the That's the way I love. I love writing like that too. Right. That is so rad. I love um, when somebody gives you a piece of instrumental music. Right. You get to just do the vocal thing. Yeah. You know, super fun because you're just outside of it and you can see it differently. You know? Totally. Well, when you write something yourself, <coughs> you have the pictures of the chords. You know where things are going right. technically, and when you don't have to think about how that came to be, yeah, you exactly. hear it as music, almost like a fan. Yeah. You might not even know what the guy was doing on the guitar or sure. You know. Um, anyway, so we had this whole song demoed out. We were happy with it, and the producer was like, um, "It's kind of like driving one of those like desert, just going for it the whole. It's like on play it, the whole time. Do you know the riff? It's like well, it's tuned weird, but it's a whole step lower than this. But it's like it's a." Like it's just like a driving cool. the whole song, yeah, and, then, really like and then the um, and then I, I that was the thing that Kemble sent me, and then I just added um, it was like a pre chorus where it was like, so it's like the same motif, just kind of goes somewhere else, yeah, but the, there's no dynamic change. So the producer, uh, Bob, was like. Um, we need something bigger there. It's got to have like a little more push and pull to it, you know, like on, on the upbeats or whatever. So I ended up changing this um, kind of thing. The so, um, so, so more give it more of like a kick, but it just kind of made it generic. Kind of, it does. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. Immediately. It's more like, yeah, like, and it was like power chord stuff, like, boom, da, 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 boom. and then he went to the chorus, and we were all like, okay, we'll just trust him because he's like got platinum records, so let's just trust him. <laughs> and at the end of the thing, this is a trying to make a long story short. At the end of the thing, um, he didn't end up mixing; we had someone else mix it. And all of us were like, you know, I really like the old pre-chorus. And I'm like, me too, because that was my, I loved it. It was like a real simple little vocal over it, and it just led into the chorus. What was the producer's name? Bob Marlette. Yeah, so everybody's like, Bob, what do you think? And he's like, wasn't there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought, Bob. Bob loves this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it actually came up, I think our management said something, and our A&R guy said something too, and they were like, we kind of like the other one. Yeah. And then, so we started talking about it, and we were like, well, I like it better too, the old way. So then, we just re-recorded that part, Whoa. and just... Flew it into the mix, and it luckily didn't sound that different. It, it, it works. The guitar tones change, but it, it kind of works. Yeah. Um, so like in that case that happened, we were yeah. all like uh, reluctantly just giving in and letting sure. him take the pre-chorus and, and change it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, we were all like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. And that Which was Bob there when you re-recorded it? No, he was out of picture. Okay, so, so he's gonna hear it later and be like, so what? Even know that no, it no. <laughs> you gotta hear it first. Sorry. <laughs> We broke the news, but you know it's all part of the process because I'm sure he was right a hundred times. And yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like right. it's one of those things too where it just shows that it doesn't matter how many platinum records you have on the wall. It's not about that. It's like he had a he had an instinct about it, really? and maybe maybe it was a good instinct, and maybe that wasn't the perfect thing to play. Right. But I it helps he was, you. It's like he was wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, it does make sense to kind of. Push, give a little more push to this part because sure. the whole song is like eighth note drivey 
Yeah. Drive your car, kind mm-hmm. of thing. But that's what the point was. Like, that was kind of the point of that part, just to keep it going, mm-hmm. you know, like almost if. Because I really like hypnotic stuff, and that just seems to put you kind of in a trance when it just kind of right. just stays on the same lane, you know? But he was like, no, it's, it's, it's not exciting enough. And we're like, okay, I guess we'll do it. And we ended, we ended up doing a whole, the whole thing, and the end of the recording process, we were just like, no, we're going to change it back. So it's funny, man, because underneath that whole thing is like, uh, what fuels our uh, decision making and stuff? It's like, mm-hmm. that that was like an intellectual and maybe even sort of A&R kind of thinking. Like, right, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that this is gonna happen, so why don't we add this, because yeah. this will be, this seems like the right thing to do. And yeah. you were in a place, and ended up in a place where it was like, I just gotta fall on my gut. Like, it feels yeah. right to That's how it came out, thing. you know? Yeah. That was just, that was natural. There's a famous quote, first thought, best thought, which is, oh, yeah. it goes against the thing of like, first draft always sucks, we gotta rewrite, but right. first thought, best thought, I think is magical, because I heard that on the Philip Glass documentary. Yeah. Long your time gut. Ago, your gut, your instinctual yeah. pull. We, we, had, we wrote about 30 songs for the record, and just to choose, because uh-huh. we were like, okay, well, this record has to be a big deal, we got a budget this time, we got a, this is the first one on this, on this label, so it's, got, it's a big deal. Um, and they're like putting money behind singles and stuff and they're doing videos and so it's like I think I brought it up I was like let's just write a ton of songs let's just write you know instead of like you know we'll write 12 15 songs and we'll record a record like let's write twice that many. so we were like we had like 30 songs what was that period of time that you, how much time did, did from the time you said that yeah until you probably like to... maybe six months we, we did have oh, some, wow. we did have some of the some of the songs that are on the record we started earlier than than that but like once we were crunch time it was mm-hmm. it was a oh, it might have been less it was probably like three months That's and the incomers right. at home like just writing like crazy That's and we cool. get together yeah it was, it was super fun that's my favorite thing to do is just sit down in front of the computer and write a little bit of pressure a due date it's always yeah. good for an artist to know what their frame is totally yeah otherwise we would and same thing with recording so you have to stop at a certain point Right. Otherwise, you just keep changing. Keep writing and recording. Keep yeah. And then it just changes. Adam and I worked with a singer songwriter that did that, mm-hmm. where he would just he was good too. He was a good songwriter. Very very politically based. Very wordy. Oh yeah. But he had cool melodies and stuff. And he was like our kind of first introduction to like higher level songwriting, because mm-hmm. I think we I had never played with somebody like that who thought in the way he thought. You know, but he would do that though. He would like go through one revision and do another one. He'd right. sit around, and think about it, and do. Oh, it. oh, you're going way back. I was trying to think of who you're talking about. I don't know. You, you can tell. Bill I mean, Madden. I'm not to say. His name yeah, is Bill Madden. Madden. He's actually a great songwriter, so it's no, no mm-hmm. slight on him. It just shows different processes. It's just his process was very like, very. Uh, you know, he would do a track. He'd think about it. He would reword the track. Yeah. You know, and I respected that because I was like, okay, cool. You have a certain vision. Yeah. And you're not getting it from that track, you know. If you can drive you mad as a as a side man, sure. Because you're, you're trying, you're like, you're like yeah. I thought 15 takes ago, whatever yeah, that was. Yeah, this was good. That was pretty good. Yeah. But he's still. But then again, it can play against you too, because For sometimes sure. it, it's good and bad. It depends on how the song ultimately comes out. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes you can talk yourself in a circle, and then when your song yeah. gets finished, it wasn't much better. It might have been better many revisions right. ago. It's yeah. very much in the eye of the holder because usually, if that's your process, is that you 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 write something, you revise it, you keep going, and it's all, and it's you're always in a state of, of bettering it, mm-hmm. that can be like a really positive thing or it can be rooted in insecurity. Yeah. If it's rooted in like getting to the core of something and you're just almost yeah. like you're, uh, you're starting out with a big block of marble and you just keep chipping away and you're like, no, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. You know, yeah. like, there's the statue. But at some but point, if you, you just chip, chip away a piece off and like the nose, you have to come in. on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're like actually tearing it apart. Well, you know, they yeah. say Peter Gabriel writes like that. Oh, okay. I've seen documentaries on him and he does that. Really? Where he just chips away well, the I'm going to do it. And Daniel Lamar would be <laughs> furious at him. You know, there was, a, there was a, one of those classic albums or whatever there, Daniel Lamar was saying that he was in a barn somewhere yeah, it was for and so. he had to finish the lyrics he's so slow. So wow. he uh, locked the he uh, locked nailed the in. barn door shut. What? And then let Peter out until he finished the lyrics. <laughs> Peter like took a chair and threw it through the door, and like came yeah. out came outside and Daniel went back down there and he had like ripped the door off the hinges. Wow! But like 
They never saw the chaos, but <laughs> Peter had clearly like flipped out and broke out. He was mad. He was, he's like, like he finished the lyrics. That's intense. But that's like that was, those are the days. It's been a whole year actually recording the record. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's so you know, yeah, everybody has their own different process, you know. But yeah, yeah. I think if, if it is if it is that thing where you're you're afraid, if there's some sort of fear based or insecurity based thing where you're like. I don't know. I just don't know if it's good enough, or maybe there's a better idea out there, and you just can't finish. That's like that can be really negative to your right. process. Totally. Just it doesn't work on me. Right. Just leave it alone. You know? Yeah, right. I think all of us together would be it would work because that's not how we work. But some people can handle that. So sure. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Like, whenever true. somebody asks you like, how do you write songs? Which like like someone's mm-hmm. looking for the answer. There's no answer, right? Everybody there's no one way to do it. I think but, the answer is just being authentic, and that, yeah. and how to be authentic is always different. But if you're, yeah. that's why it's good to, to know that every every way is okay, and the only wrong way is if you're scared or insecure yeah. in your process and leads you towards yeah. And no matter who you are, you're gonna have a moment of doubt in something you do. You know, you just gotta work through right. that doubt. Here's a story too that I learned a lot from, which is, you know, I've written hundreds and hundreds of songs as a solo artist, and very very instinctual and very just like my process is like I'm doing kind of everything and I really like that because it feels like I'm writing in my journal mm-hmm. and my my attitude's always been I don't co-write my journal so like yeah. <laughs> I don't bring you in to go hey, what can, push push can you help me with this thing that I did today <laughs> yeah. so that's been my personal process and then so collaborations have always been uh, something that I've loved doing, but also that I sometimes struggle with. Because yeah. the more I, the more of myself I put into something, the more I have to remember I'm collaborating. Right. Because I start to feel like, oh, this is starting to feel like it's mine, and my process yeah. is so solitary. So the grip, you have to yeah, the grip. I have to let it go. Or I came to realize that you know collaboration is more about putting separately written pieces together as opposed to working right. necessarily on the same yeah. part. If you're yeah. building something, it's like if you have blocks and everybody has like a different block, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a great way to put Your it. block isn't the right color. So just add it to this one and then I'll do this. And that's a lot to do with chemistry too. Like the people in the room, yeah. if there's a good chemistry and there's a good sort of trust, mm-hmm. you know, there's not somebody being boorish. If there's a guy in the room being a dick, mm-hmm. then it makes it really hard to be in a comfortable spot to collaborate. Yeah, or, that or judgy, be, like you can't, that's a weird thing too. Oh yeah, it's almost like a naysayer in the room. Yeah, you know how people talk about improv and um, the comedy improv and the whole, like, the golden rule is that you can't ever say no. It's always yes, and. yes and. Yeah. That's how songwriting has to be, I think. Mm-hmm. I yeah, agree. You're right. Even if you don't like the idea, that that's another kind of rule like, in, in our band, is that, like, when someone has an idea, we have to try it. There's no, like, no, it's cheesy. It's like, oh, I think that sounds stupid, but... Let's we have to try. Yeah. Because you you know, you never are you doing it with, with love or are you doing it with like this like That's the hard part. I will try yeah. to do this dumb idea you're like, and just show you this. Stupid, dude. Look how bad this is. And you're playing it worse than you normally would if you yeah, cared yeah. about it. Like, See I told you it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Case in so point. The story I was gonna share is along those lines was something that I I learned through writing with um, John Foreman from Switchfoot and going through this process of writing this song called This Is Home. So to make a really long story short, we had, Andy and I had written this song and recorded it ourselves and we're putting it for the Chronicles of Narnia movie and unbeknownst to us, so was John. So John was pitching songs and we were pitching songs and I'm sure lots of other people were pitching songs. Were you guys working together at the time? No. Oh. So I I I'd, I'd never met him, um, and this was through Hollywood Records, and uh, which is like Disney's label. So the guy that was um, kind of executive producing this 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 album was like, I really love your song. I'm gonna try to get somebody to do it. So at the end of the day, they were like, Hey, John, do you want to try this song that Adam and Andy did? He's like, That's not really my thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't just sing other people's songs with yeah. a songwriter. So they, he came back to us and he's like, I, I dig your song, I dig John's ideas. And I'm like, well, just give me his phone number and I'll just call him, you know? We know some of the same people, whatever. And I called him and said, why don't we just get together and see, because the guy's name was Mitchell. Mitchell's digging some of your stuff, some of our stuff. Why don't we just see if they sure. go together? So he came up and it turned out that his verse worked really great with parts of our chorus. Wow, that's awesome. And then we rewrote the chorus to fit more with his verse, and then 
it all started to come together. And this was during the period where John was writing his four EPs. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were all based on the seasons. Yeah, yeah. And so it was going to be like a John Foreman solo thing. So we write this song. Uh, it turned out to be called This Is Home. And it was one of those great collaborative things where he brought this verse Just and sort of put it to the, I would say, probably the infrastructure of our chorus and then rewrote it. Um, to be what it is now and then it slowly became he's like you know this is sounding more like a switchfoot song mm -hmm. and so one at a time each each guy started coming over and Whoa. we ended up making we would just be like oh there's Adam's drums let's take him away and bring in the new drums yeah. and during that process I came to see like the way S switchfoot operates yeah yeah so That's you know John is very much you can tell that there's a solo artist at the core of that band, mm -hmm. yet they totally collaborate in this very, like what you're talking about. You can kind of hear it in the, in the songs. Too. Yeah. Like if you didn't even know that band, you can kind of, right? Yeah, you can sort of, you can, you can see what it's like, oh, there's that guy, and then the other guys that have these colors or whatever. You know? Totally. So to see that happen as we're actually like muting and re-recording all yeah. our tracks to make it a 100% Switchfoot song mm -hmm. is super interesting and frustrating because my process... Yeah. I was like, well, here's that's like the way the kick drum pattern goes. It's yeah. the bass. Yeah. And but what what I didn't see is that I was sort of holding on to parts of the original chorus we had written, right. and not fully letting go into what it had become. And at one point, uh, they they interact in a way where they talk, they throw around a lot of um, references. That's how they communicate as a band. So like yeah, like, like oh, it's kind of a police thing. It's like a, a Zeppelin thing. Okay. Or, and that's how they communicate, which is also the opposite of the way I communicate. Like, I, I try to be a, totally disconnected from influences and try to do, yeah. just let them naturally come out. So that was hard for me, too. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that got thrown out was, uh, what if it's more like a Tom Petty thing? And I was like, Tom Petty? <laughs> like, inside, I was kind of saying that. And I'm like, I love Tom Petty, but yeah. this doesn't seem like Tom Petty. And so they go in, and what had been more of a rhythmic push and pull drum part with chords kicking on the hand of two yeah, and four, yeah. stuff Just like that. Down the Drummer did like one and three, right. which I'm a huge fan of, but for some reason I was pulling against it in this setting. So the drummer goes in and goes, and I'm like, whoa. Okay, I'm starting to see it. You got dizzy a little bit? Like, I got dizzy, what? but I was like, whoa. And then all of a sudden the song took on this higher quality and I'm like, Wow, I'm so glad wow. that I wasn't in charge at that moment because <laughs> this is home. There was all these upbeats and it was playing against the drums. What was it before? Like you followed the. It was more like this is home. It was one of those things yeah. at first, yeah. and what we were playing around it made that make sense, but it, in the end, it just turned out to be strumming, beach, fire, and it ended up being right. So it was like, oh wow, you can actually, it definitely shifted my view of like, wow, you can get somewhere new by just plugging away and trying different things, and then all of a sudden you can. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. That, that, I love that, those kind of bands, where you hear personalities, you know, mm -hmm. subtle little, Colors mm -hmm. you would just never have, you know. Like I mean, I think all the greatest bands are like that. Yeah. Like you look at Radiohead. If you took out the bass player, it would not be the same band. Oh yeah. You know, for sure. classic Zeppelin or whatever. Like, you do it. Yeah. Same thing. With your band, do you um, pro tool stuff or do you keep it real natural? Uh oh. What can't really tell you. <laughs> it actually depends. The the record we did previously when I just had joined the band. And we started writing together. <clears throat> Super loose. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just like we didn't touch the drums. Mm -hmm. We just kind of had let them. Yeah. Um, the dr our drummer is actually a, a an engineer also, so he'll oh, do okay. like his own stuff. Yeah, yeah. So who knows what he's doing? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, that's his. You know, that's his art. Yeah, he's sure. Do that, yeah. But I think on the on the last record, I think we left it pretty pretty, pretty natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the whole thing's like a little looser and whatever. But this this one, we we there was more editing for sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're going from, like to the because you're going for more of a polished sound. Yeah. This time around. Yeah, we're trying to kind of step up the production value. So right. some of it's a little more like lined up for sure. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't think any of that's bad. I think it's all it's all serves the music. Yeah, it has to be. That's what happened. You know. 
Yeah, yeah. totally. I just I, like hearing a drummer get excited and like rush a fill a little bit and come back. You know, man. It, so, if it's the right kind of song, you know, it's like it's way more exciting. For sure. That's why people love Not Rolling, Rolling Stones. Yeah. Because it's, it's a whole group performance. You're getting a yeah. whole feeling. I heard a story about that, a little anecdote to share. Um, talking to Jack Joseph Quigg, this mixing engineer oh, yeah. producer, and he was mixing a Rolling Stones record, and he gets the session up, like his, his assistant prepares it for him, and he's like, all right, here we go. Starts bringing up tracks, and he's like, <laughs> pull that back. I don't know if this is, and then he, he just went, well, uh, uh, put the whole thing up, and he went, uh, Rolling Stones. Wow, that's amazing. Because he was every track on its own had its funk, and like, sure. you know, maybe things that somebody would fix if you put it up, but yeah. then, He's like, no way, man. It's about how that thing just sort of like... Yeah, have gel. Yeah, you, can't, you can't line up Keith Richards. Like, isn't yeah. he supposed to be like the most amazing feel. guitar player? Like, well, that's why I tell Adam when I do when I play bass, I go, don't solo the bass. <laughs> you always say so that. Listen, just listen to it as yeah. it is. Because yeah. when you solo a bass, invariably, you're going to hear like it's yeah. <laughs> stuff, you know? But in the track, you never notice it, and it feels like something. That's I'm not like, saying it's uh, always right. I'm just saying that there is a feel. Right. So when you guys, okay, so that this is actually good for people to know that are in bands and stuff. So when you guys get to the point of going to tour, how does that work? You guys doing? Are you touring a van? Do you, yeah, we you get per diem. Like what? It, how does that look for you guys monetarily to, to tour? Like you said, you break even. So what does exactly yeah. that mean? Well, we we have um, we have our own van. We're lucky enough. The drummer has a That's van, great. which is amazing. Yeah. Before that, we were just rent. You know, we just rent a van. Mm -hmm. um, you guys no, we just pile everything in there, and we just do hope we do cheap hotels, or if we know people, you know, crash some people. But um, I think the longer we do it, though, the more it's like let's just get out of time, you know. Right. Just, oh yeah. But There's then nothing again, worse than like being in a car for eight hours or in some random. Yeah, and you all have to be in the same room. Dude, for our last listen to this. Our last two tours <laughs> ended in Chicago. Yeah. And it was the last show. Oh. So we drove from Chicago. All the way back twice, wow, twice in a row. Long, that's yeah. like whatever, like twenty-five hours yeah, or something. Several days of driving. After the fun is over worse. too. Oh yeah, yeah. You're the like, whole thing's over. You just want to just home. sit in the, and you've been with the same people for like a month or a couple <laughs> weeks or whatever. And you just like, so home. will you tour for a month? <laughs> the last one we did was a, uh, we went out with Local H in the nineties. So you guys went for a whole month, four weeks straight. Yeah, that was four four weeks. Is this um, gonna be similar? I don't know. We don't. Uh, you mean the next one? Yeah. We don't. It's not locked in yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it might be. It might be the kind of what they're talking about right now is doing like starting on the west coast with one band and then and then meeting up with another band on the east coast, mm -hmm. which would be rad. But the la uh, we toured with Buck Cherry. Yeah. Buck Cherry, mm -hmm. and they're in a, a bus, right? They have like I think it was one bus. They might have two, but it was just I think I know it was one bus and everybody was in that bus. Okay. So obviously, from a bus, you can just sleep on the bus. Yeah. So we that were following too. them in a van. Yeah. So we couldn't sleep on the van because somebody has to drive all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, just oh, the van. So they're yeah, just right. like, after the show, boom, and then they're sleeping, they get there. So we had like a bunch of nights where we just stopped at a hotel and slept four hours and then got back up and left again, just to catch up. <laughs> so it's the no sleep tour. It was horrible. Yeah. There was at least a couple of shows that were like that. Yeah. You know, four or five hours. And so you pay for the hotel room and then you just get up and leave. Oh. But is it just one room just too? Just to try to catch up. You guys just show That's when you just buy like, sometimes we'll do two rooms. You buy four sidecars and put it under the bus and sleep. Seriously. On. Or just something on the top of the bus. <laughs> yeah. A little sleeping. Tense. I've done the thing where you where you do the, you kind of travel on a tour bus, and that sucks too. Because you really want your own space after a while. Being in a, yeah, you're even if you're in your little cocoon, like you still come out and you still see the same dudes, and you're just like, yeah. and I'm more introverted, so I'm like, you want I'm really sick of seeing you. Yeah. Even though you're funny half the time, I don't, want, I don't want to see you. The other half, you. you're the worst. You don't work. <laughs> but it's funny, the band dynamic's an interesting thing, especially if you're yeah. on the road, because what starts off is, yeah, mm -hmm. by about midway to tour, you're totally. just like, no, yeah. just <laughs> go away. Yeah. I know, it's all exciting, and then you, I mean, for you me, you're the same stories, the same jokes. Yeah, the smelling same, the same It's always people. a tour joke, too, some show or something. Smelling small. the same people. It's just the same smells, you know. Yep. And, and, and especially in a van, it's a tight space. Oh, dude. Like, yeah, you guys are like really... And at the end of it, the whole, you just walk in there, it's just funk. Oh, just yeah. funk on the walls. I can imagine. Funk dripping. <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Does anybody smoke? Oh, and, uh, no, there's no smokers, okay, but the drummer sweats like a fish. Eat. There's a fish sweat. <laughs> he's just like, they have drunk he literally water. plays like, I don't know, fish. <laughs> uh, he plays very hard. Yeah. And he 
gets uh, works up a sweat like within one song. Oh, he's drenched after the show back in the van. Oh, so he has it. He's his shirt off, and it's oh, like you can ring it out. And I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. Every show you can ring his shirt out. That's so he'll just like throw the shirt that locker underneath. room funk in there. <laughs> yeah, like we'll lose one of his t-shirts underneath the seat, and then the next oh, day, dude. Like, ah. <laughs> and then you have to get it out, you know, and it's still wet. Oh, like, <laughs> yeah. That's been, there's been a couple times when you just like, throw the sh- oh, shirt underneath rough. the front seat. Yeah, it's disgusting. It's got to be punishment for that kind of stuff. Now, is the label paying for the tour as well? Or giving you a, a salary? Okay, you're salad. digging deep into the finances. Well, yeah. I'm just curious because yeah, I, I think, it's, like, I think no. it's interesting for other bands to hear how it works. We haven't had any tour support up to this point. Mm-hmm. We might, mm-hmm. um, but. I don't know. At the same time, like it's still your money. Like, yeah, you're, right. still, you're still you're gonna have to open your pocket. So and you sell merch. Yeah, for sure. That's the that's you know the only thing you can do is just make a bunch of t-shirts and right. Who creates the t-shirts? Is it kind of group effort? Or do you guys have somebody who does it? We uh, you know, like for as collaborative as I talk about the band, it's not easy. Like there's a lot of like <laughs> strong opinions and yeah. lots of yeah. emails and text messages. Just like is this cool? Is this cool? Yeah. One guy hates the t-shirt design, and the other guy likes it. Whatever. Oh, it's to so me, it's hard. just like, just put, put it together, then we'll do another shirt. It doesn't matter. Right. But there's definitely lots of... So you kind of a keeper? Actually, yeah. I am. You are? Actually, there's definitely dynamics, you know? So if we're talking about touring and taking the music on the road, and, and we're talking about this record being more of like a concerted effort to like raise the bar on what you're doing and obviously a little more not not thinking commercial necessarily um, in the bad sense but just making the best thing you can that is yeah, the best version it's of your band. the most commercially okay so yeah and then that manifests in you know like if if it's broke we fix it in the studio like there's more editing mm-hmm. and what Gannon said earlier about that's not necessarily a bad thing I totally agree I see like I see recorded music as almost like a painting, you know, it's like, yeah. if you make a, a wrong stroke on that painting, it's like, you know what it should be, you don't have to just leave it because that's what you happen to do, right. paint over it, get it right, and that's what editing really is, it's mm-hmm. making a work of art that's going to stand the test of time, right. you could have the drummer do 20 takes and get the same result, or you could have him do three passionate takes and fix a few things mm-hmm. and save the time to yeah. get the painting right, it's like, yeah. All that stuff is, is okay. I think mean, that's the beauty of modern recording. It's just, I kind of liken it to, to uh, when it goes wrong, I feel like it's a lot like uh, plastic surgery and celebrities. It's like, when what goes wrong? When, when editing goes, goes wrong. wrong. Oh. It's like, oh, when you can see it. Yeah, like Michael Jackson is a good example of somebody who edited his own face to the <laughs> point where. It was, and he went too far, and you can do that with a drum track. You can just be like, ooh, right, I fixed yeah. that one thing, maybe that means I should fix that, and that, and that, and that, and then all of a sudden, you yeah. might as well have programmed it. Right. So you gotta have that sense of taste, yeah. you know? Like if you were born with a cleft lip or whatever, like, fix that. But that doesn't mean you should get your eyes and your nose and your ears and your jaw, <laughs> like everything yeah, else. How far do you go with that? How far do you go? And so now this record is like, you looked at it that way, and you've created this thing that's like, yeah. And crafted. When you go on the road, are you guys thinking, let's reproduce what we've crafted? Or are you going to take the reins off and kind of let it breathe? I think to a certain extent, yeah. Like structure wise, for sure. You're going to keep it? Um, You're glad that it is what it is? I don't know. That's a good question. Cause I, it depends. I think we there's different uh, opinions within the members. Yeah. Because I'm more of a hippie. I'd rather like just jam. <laughs> Can we just extend <laughs> the. I always want to like add a longer intro, because so, live it's just different. It's a know? show, yeah, it's and I don't think I would want to go see my favorite band play just like the record. Because if I did, it's like watching a video or something, like sure. a music video. Yeah, you know, you I I've always wanted to see bands. I, actually, ever since as long as I can remember, I I'm like expecting a band to do something different live. Right. You know? Even That's though it's obviously different because it's happening in front of you and it's you're seeing it happen. Right. You're kind of a part of it, but. Um, I'm personally more of the opinion of like, let's, you know, extend this section or let's, you know, and then you want to like thread songs together sometimes, back to back, whatever, so, yeah. but um, I think it's different within the band, like our drummer is way more structured, structured, which is great, because he keeps the wagon on the wagon track, <laughs> that's bad, wagon train, on the track, the train on the track, that's a better, the wagon could be on the track too. G wagon. 
Um, but then, like, when it comes, and probably the bass player's like that, too. It's just like, it's the bass players guys are always like that. They're always like the guys that are together. Yeah, which is good. I think they, sh- they should be. And then me and Kemble are just like loose cannons. Like, we're just running around the stage and, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm probably more structured than he is, because if I have a guitar solo, I'm going to probably play it. Like the record, I might oh. tweak it a little bit. It's more of a melody. Where he would just be like, I don't even care. Just, I'm just gonna. It feels like this tonight. I'm just gonna do this. You know? Okay. Um, he's more of like impulsive. Yeah, yeah it's great. Like, and he's kind of like the front man guy, so you want him to do that. But I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that because I think it depends. Well, it sounds like you guys haven't started rehearsing for the tour necessarily, right? No, yeah. we started and then the tour got canceled. And okay. So we're not doing anything. Yeah. Um, so that, that'll be interesting to see because. It sounds like you guys have a good juxtaposition of balances, you know, if the bass and drummer yeah. want to lock it down and you'll talk about what's extended, but then you guys will have room. If you take the train the, analogy, it's yeah. like the train's going like this, but you guys can be running back and forth and it's still going yeah, right yeah, yeah, exactly. And the longer the track. you guys play, you'll extend things naturally because you're sick of playing the same way after a while. You know? Accidents yeah. will happen. You know the keyboard. worst example of changing a song is? Gears Sting. Thing. Oh. <laughs> Dude, you hate when Sting changes his damn song. Oh, not one specific. <laughs> like Roxanne, he'll make into like this stupid you know, lounge lizard. Like Roxanne, <laughs> you don't have to tell. He changes the melody. He changes the feel. It's like you're just going like when I was talking about the police thing. It's like, like what happened? He like changed everything. I know. And he made everything uh, slower. I remember Roxanne really? was like a dirge. Dude, I hate like, it. G G. <laughs> Yeah, it was like weird. Like the police haven't played together in like well, whatever thirty years or whatever. It's been longer than that probably. And they finally do that well, tour. Yeah. And then everything's different. It's like it's not even the same song anymore. It's like just yeah, you because can't. you can doesn't mean you should. With iconic songs like that, it's like no. you can't change something. Because right? it's depressing. Because you see that and you just go, oh, I'd rather listen to the record. Yeah. You? It's almost it's the same thing, man. They've they've they're so inside what they're doing and they're so. Well, stay Maybe it's the ego, yeah. It's like, it's like I've played this so many times. Like it's more important right. that I'm not bored than it is. Yeah, like super the song. And he's yeah. played it more than they have. Like he's been still touring, playing those songs. <laughs> so he's even had, you know, now he really hates the song. Yeah, Stuart's like, let's just play the song. Yeah, you know, he's just like, dude, let's get some energy into this thing. He's yeah, like, but isn't that the bummer? Because you're watching him going, I know that he hates the song. Yeah, but he has to play it. And that's what he for me. Yeah, he just right. any new way he can tweak it so he doesn't have to. Yeah, you can play tell that he hates it. Yeah, he likes this about that. That comes back to this conversation of what you're going to do on tour. Is you listen? I just the other day threw on the original recording of Every Breath You Take, mm-hmm. and that obviously is just I one of the greatest songs in pop history, I think. And um, I was telling my wife the whole story about how it's not a love song; it's about a stalker, basically. Yeah. And um, she hadn't heard that and was like, whoa, it's crazy. And mm-hmm. that's this whole other layer. I think that's part of why people love the song. But yeah. the reason I brought it up is what hap- what's, what's happened, it started happening in the 90s when you see Sting perform that song. It almost sounds like, and I'm, I love Sting, so I don't want to. I don't, so you can say whatever. Okay, great. So it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like Tom Jones' <laughs> approach to singing Every Breath You Take. Ross! <laughs> well, there's. He's made it like this. Loud. <laughs> Maybe Tom Jones is the wrong thing, but turning it into this more like soulful thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Where yeah. Sting's he like reggae. Yeah, yeah. He's got that. His thing. cold reggae performance of, of that song. You could you easily. Da, 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 like that whole thing. That whole thing, and just like. Every breath you take. It's so, he, now he's like, every breath you take. It's almost like Tim McGraw saying Every it move like, oh. you make. <laughs> it just turns, breath. it's like, wow, performance. That's weird. Meeting up with composition yeah. is like, that's what makes gold. Sure. I've heard bad versions yeah. of With or Without You. It's so easy to cheese up something and then you don't really hear the magic of what that song could be. Yeah. Oh, let me you ask you this. Okay. About that breath back at you. Bring it. Full circle. Have you ever done that though with your songs? Done what? Where, okay, so let's say like you have a song that people know and then maybe you just, it's not in your favorite range or something uh-huh. or there's something that you're kind of bored singing it. Yep. Do you ever do that too? Because I do it, totally. I've, I've done it actually in my band, Fallborn. Mm-hmm. That was one of the biggest Brilliant. contentions <laughs> that uh, me and Nick had is that 
I had this feeling of wanting to, mm-hmm. okay, there's the recording. And now live, like I wanted to stretch, stretch things out or be more um, emotive and slightly improvisational. Yeah. And w- since I wrote the songs, I kind of felt like, oh, here's where I could do that and here's where I yeah. want. And he would really miss the original melodies and be like, yeah. dude, why are you singing it? melody or why, why are you changing this changing that and and I would be like I'm trying to bring something fresh to the moment right. and in the end I think the reality was I was probably changing it too much because I was just so hungry to to explore and you know so much of my life has been in the studio and mm-hmm. but I probably was making some poor decisions about what to keep and what not to <laughs> but is that bad like it's in the eye of the beholder, I think. I think it's probably, if I were to go back and like listen to all those shows, I'd probably be like, if you don't know the song, <laughs> it also depends on how well your band is known. If yeah, we're out sure. there in front of new people every night, and I'm changing what well, it's all really the same, right melody. But then again, it's all the same. I should probably keep it. But then again, it's all the same. They don't know it. So That's you, true, you too. But it, if you're trying to get the like, There's the, no difference. The yeah. But the problem is, I'm just changing it into whatever, yeah. when really... I had written it and, and crafted it to be Thought it out, thing. yeah, certainly. So am I writing it better yeah. on stage? Right. Most likely I'm experimenting yeah. on it. Yeah. There's also the thing where, like, I don't know how you write, you know, vocal parts to your songs, but, like, if you're sitting there or standing, whatever you're doing, like, just standing, you could be kneeling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever you're doing, like, you, you're, it's so thought out that, like, you know that's the best way, that that's going to be catchy or that melody is going to get across. <clears throat> but if you're st- if you're in a um, on a stage, it's like there's way more. There's adrenaline. There's like lights. There's people. So totally, you know, you're gonna feel it differently. Yeah. So it's not necessarily worse, but like it's a, it almost seems like the best possible version of that is gonna have to be the thought out one that you did in the studio. So like I, I just know because I'll get bored singing melodies that I know work that are written, but I'm just right. kind of bored of them. So I'll kind of be like a little, <laughs> put a little, <laughs> in there. And then I know it's probably not as cool, but to me, I just have to do it. Right, which is a selfish thing, it's right? Selfish, yeah. But it's, <laughs> the whole thing's selfish anyway. And some yeah. people appreciate that, and they always have the record, but what did they come to see? That's, it's all hard. And I think, what I start to think of with that is like, when it comes to boredom, there's always a different subtext you can put on a melody. And like, I think, if I were to decide today, like, what would be my attitude if I went and played, like, my new record live? Mm-hmm. And I had those... Are you going to? Those, uh, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I'll be in the front row, dude. It could be in the band. I'll be in the band, <laughs> bro. Yes. So, I mean, if I were to approach it, I would probably think, you know, having gone through wanting to explore more and coming back, I would mm-hmm. probably be like, maybe my my improvisational instincts are best served by bringing a new emotion to it rather than actually changing, changing the content. Because right yeah. br- giving it a different inflection or giving it a different soul is a more subtle way to improvise. You know, like, mm-hmm. I think that's what, um, you know, classical music, and we were talking about this relative to pop and stuff, but in music that isn't improvisational, there's still, you can bring a lot to it by not changing the written notes or the mm-hmm. rhythms. Right. through inflection and through sure, like, yeah. how you play it, not necessarily what you play. Yeah, even like as a guitar player, like you touch yeah, the way that you hit the note or whatever. Sure. It's totally different, but it could be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Totally. And it creates a new dynamic for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was once falsetto could be full voice, that yeah. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but That's tough. And some people love to hear things line. different. I think Cheryl Crow, for example, I read her biography and she was getting slammed by on her first record, the producer, Bill Vitrell, highly respected producer, did an amazing job on that first record. It stands up, I think, and he had worked with Michael Jackson and all these pop artists, but he made this incredible, what they call kind of like an alternative country record. Country, yeah. And Cheryl went out and was like doing blues licks all over oh, really? the record. I don't picture her doing that, because she seems more like a by the book. But apparently not and that was and I'd seen some of those early recordings you can find them on YouTube but a lot of like kind of blues inflections and added lips just going for it and everybody that had worked on the Tuesday Night Music Club record was like sing the songs <laughs> that's how we wrote them yeah. and it's they, they actually were and a couple, one of the guys like in the band I think and there was a lot of stuff going back and forth but there was an era a 
few albums later, like she's one of my favorite people who expands on melodies live. Oh, really? Does she do that? She does, like a bit. It's not a lot, but it's like, hmm. oof. It's kind of like Bonnie Raitt too. It's like they're just such good singers and so like right. they have that ability, that um, I guess technical ability on what they do. And when she does it, like when you hear her sing, if it makes you happy, and some of those classics, mm. she'll add these things. It's like you respect the song, but you gave you something new. Uh, so maybe she figured it out. Yeah, the formula. That's funny because I saw her live. I mean, I, she's great. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan, but I was bored to tears. Really? Because I felt like they just played the song. I felt like. Oh, okay. Yeah, I felt like it was. Was it recent? No, longer? it was probably like I don't know, five or ten years ago. Was it when John Mayer was opening? Yeah. That's because, when I saw her too. Oh really? Did you see the opening band? Marjorie no. Fair? That's why I was there. Wait, Wait was that the one with what's her name? Wait, no. No, no girls. No girls. No, no chicks. Anyways, That's the reason they were on that tour is because Cheryl Crow was in love with that band. Oh really? And a, a, it was um, Scott Lord, this ba- a really great bass player, he just played with Jaden Lavick. Oh, okay. Um, he was in that band. And they opened for that tour, which was insane. But it didn't right. fit. That's the problem. Like, no. They don't sound like John Mayer, they don't sound like Cheryl Crow. It's like already Really, really mellow, um, super great song. It's like Beatles songwriting, but like all the tempos are super slow and killer, <laughs> like vintage audience. tones. Yeah, and I'm sure they were just like a whole tour. So I went and watching. Super great band, but. So you were bored in tears. What's that one? You know what's it's interesting about that? Is I saw that t- same tour and was on the grass seats at Verizon. Oh, Did you rest in peace? Yeah, there you go. Rest in peace. Uh, ah, so, bummer. Yeah, this is the last year. And they're not free to tear it down. Wow. So bad. That's a nice so condo. So yep. Yeah. Yeah. Irvine Company. Anyway, so <laughs> how sad. I remember sitting on the grass and listening to John Mayer set. Mm-hmm. And he was he was doing a little bit of what we're talking about. He was like oh, extending sure. everything and playing a zillion guitar solos. <laughs> and I was like, where's the song? And then <laughs> I can't it, see it from the grass. <laughs> <see> it. <laughs> And then he would play like. Uh, then he would. Res- then the context would change to where it fit. Like slow dancing in a burning room oh, yeah. was like. I was like, I got chills thinking about it. It was yeah. one of the like. One of my favorite performances I'd seen in a long time. Like it was yeah. such a great song, and it lent itself to a long blues solo, sure, yeah. and it was just epic. But what I remember about that tour is that, from back on the grass. I felt like John May the majority of John Mayer's songs were meant for a smaller venue. Oh yeah, sure. I felt like it was like Wiltern and Smaller were like the size of his songs. Yeah, and when Cheryl Crow came on, and maybe it's just because her songs are so famous, but I felt like all of a sudden the songs matched the venue. Oh, and I was wow, like, cool. wow. That makes sense though. What a difference. Right. Yeah. But in terms of maybe boredom, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I was bored. I just expected like a little more what you were talking about, a little Blair. more embellishment or whatever. Yeah. I just felt like he just played a hit after hit after hit, and it was just like it was the hit story. Like, uh, yeah. The so hit felt story. Like she was phoning it in a little bit. I don't know. Maybe. But then again, she just sang the national anthem on at one of the um, debates recently. Oh, right. I heard about that. She changed that melody too. <laughs> she changed it around it. No, she killed it. It was great. Oh, did she? The best I've ever. Oh wow. Heard. That was a couple months ago. A month ago. Have so you heard the Carl? Uh, Who's that guy? The, the Olympic guy? Or no, the the guy, yeah, the Olympian who sang the national anthem. Carl Lewis. Uh, Carl Lewis. He's like a long jumper? Or, or no, it's old. Runner? No, but he starts off way too high. Oh, yeah, that's too high. <laughs> he goes, that's the national anthem! He goes, whoa! And he says, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'll get you back on this one. I'll get you back. Now, hang in, there. Oh, yeah. No way. It's classic. You gotta watch it on YouTube. Dude, didn't Christina Aguilera butcher that too recently? Sure, she oh, did. Oh, I don't know. She's the Russian monster. Maybe it wasn't her. It was one of those, like, big. I think you're right, though. I think she did demolish the. Yeah. It's still all the time. She can't help but riff. She likes to riff. She can riff, though. For she sure. can. That's the thing. If you've got that ability, you definitely want to use it. You know what's interesting about her? Is there's this thing called a Masterclass. Have you seen it promoted on YouTube? Mm-hmm. Where, uh, I don't think so. Uh, lots of actors are doing it, you know, uh, Give classes. Dustin Hoffman, yeah, you can go and order the classes online, and it's like a small oh. group setting where you watch them teach acting, and, mm-hmm. um, so she, she did one of those, Usher did one, and I saw her ad for it, and I was like, wow, it's, it was actually really on point, like I thought, mm. like her whole, Christina Aguilar, when she was talking about teaching singing and performance, mm-hmm. 
And I was like, man, take your own advice. Oh, really? It was a little bit like that. It was like, because she's known for kind of over riffing. Yeah. She's like Steve Ray Nam Steve Napoleon. Right. <laughs> Dude, he's in the Ingbe Shreds. No. Is it good? You know the Shreds video? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. His is the ultimate. Really? It's the yeah. ultimate. I saw one Because right he's just like playing the whole time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we just watched the two Korea shirts. That was great. And the One Direction one's pretty amazing. Too. That's great. <laughs> well, should we do a jam? Oh, man. Well, yeah. before we do that, can you give everybody the information for your band and all the Twitter and all yeah. that? What's happening? I'll put that at... Or you can just put it at the end, I guess. I'll put it at the end and uh, spell ages in case somebody wants oh, to just bail out. Two, two E's. A-E-G-E-S. So I can't wait to hear it. I've that before. Lawsuit. I'm excited to hear it. Cool. Mm -hmm. I can show you some. Yeah, let me hear the record. Yeah, I hear you. No, I mean like actual. Actual tracks. Oh, oh. I was going to say, go ahead and sing something. We have weird tunings. Oh, uh, okay. This is literally here. Then I can chant over your song. One of our tunings is two A's. Oh, well. Uh, the E goes all the way to the A. So you get like all these third chords. And then. Is it uh, What's that song on uh, that Soundgarden song up and down the upside? They have some crazy times. That's a little C, right? Follow they do that. Yeah. The they have a tune that's all E and B. Do you know that? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, it's on. I read it on Wikipedia. It's like, um, oh, uh, my wave. Yeah. It's like E B E B E B. Wow, that's strange. Yeah, it's well, super weird. It's all the chords. Are just strange. Let's just play uh, whatever you want to play. You start playing, and I'll follow you. Who, me? Yeah, you. Who, what? How about you start? You're the virtuoso. Ringing sound